Good evening, friends. Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live here again with another segment on Tovia Singer and his dismantling of the Christian faith, uh, or at least his attempt to. And quite frankly, he is very successful in getting to people to believe the information that he's putting out. Now, in some cases, Tovia makes very good arguments. But the thing is, you got to dig a little deeper sometimes to really get to the truth of the matter. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on doing exactly that in these series of messages to debunk uh, the accusations that, uh, that Tovia Singer is making against Christianity. There's a lot of effects in the way Tovia puts together his videos on his channel under his name, Tovia Singer, there. Uh, is very dramatic to try to capture your attention, to try to get you to focus on the key uh, part of the topic that he's going to be addressing in his video. Today, the attack is on the book of Matthew and the credibility, as he puts it, of the author of Matthew or even the translations of the book of Matthew there. So rather than, we're, going, we're not going to be going into the teaching per se like I did the, uh, the other day uh, or yesterday, the, the video that I did then, uh, where I also take on Tovia's uh, accusations against the book of John, but this time it's going to be dedicated fully to the context of what Tovia is actually talking about. So let's go into this. And, and by the way, please, don't, uh, I don't want you to go out and attack Tovia, beat him up, things like that uh, in, in regards to what, what I'm saying here. Uh, I want to do this in, in, a, in a kind way. Uh, Tovia, if you'll ever notice, even when he is taking on Christians, uh, he's challenging them, etc. He's passionate about what he believes. There's no doubt about it. He's very fundamentalist in what he believes in Judaism. No doubt about it. Uh, but he also does try to do it with, uh, with, with I, what I would call respect. Uh, and so I think that we, uh, we should do that and should show love. Uh, and not just go out and try to, to attack someone back because we disagree with them. So, uh, and so therefore, I'm doing these messages because it takes a great deal of research and work. And Tovia is really, he's got an amazing brain on him. He remembers a lot of things. He's very well knowledgeable in his subjects there. So if you're ever planning on trying to take this man on in any kind of debate publicly, you might want to think twice before you do that. Jesus said, be wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. And that's exactly the approach we need to take. Let's listen in. Like I said, it's going to be very dramatic effects that Tovia is using in here, which kind of uh, makes me a little suspicious of what is really going on behind the scenes. But listen in. If it doesn't say that, we can then conclude with certainty that whoever wrote the book of Matthew lied about Isaiah mistranslated the verse, and therefore his credibility collapses along with the credibility of the entire Christian Bible. Now, before I continue to let this play, he's saying that if, if you'll notice that, if he mistranslated it, if he, uh, if he wrote it and lied about what Isaiah said, et cetera, et cetera, then you know, the credibility of the entire New Testament falls apart. All right, let's continue on. Now, what we're going to find out here in just a moment, though, is Tovia is actually going to go into the caller. There's going to be a caller. All right, Kelly, you're And up. that caller is going to ask the question about the virgin born in Isaiah, uh, the, the, where the scripture speaks about, you know, or, or the way it's translated in English, a virgin shall conceive. Uh, this is from the, the book of Isaiah. And uh, that's what the caller is going to do. So we want to pay, pay close attention to the question that's being asked and the way that uh, Tovia Singer responds to it. And then we're going to tackle the subject ourselves and correct it once and for all, including correcting the complete. Um, well, let's just let's let's listen in. Live on the air, please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hello, Rabbi Tovia Singer. My name is Israel. I'm living in Montana. Uh, my question is out of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. It says that Emmanuel will be born of a virgin. So when dealing with the JC topic, I never hear rabbis say 
yes, Emmanuel was born of a virgin, and he existed, and he, we call and the Christians call him JC. Or no, we don't believe he was born, and he never existed, and Christianity is just made up. So what path do you take on that? Thank you. Could you like not hang up that quickly? Is that possible? But like, you could you stay with me. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, go ahead. Right. Stay with me on this. So, are you familiar with the Hebrew language? Uh, I am teaching it to my sons currently, as well as I can get it from America uh, oh. through right. my resources like YouTube. Right. I'll just I'll quickly say too when he says he's teaching it to his sons, you're going to also find out he really doesn't know Hebrew. Uh, Tovia is going to pick up on that, by the way, and it's not he's not going to he's not going to belittle the guy for for being that way. But he's also going to realize that the guy is a Christian because any any Jewish person would know if you live in America, it doesn't matter if you live in America or not. You can go to any synagogue and your children can learn Hebrew there uh, for free. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, in fact, that's the way I learned Hebrew from the very beginning was from a synagogue. Uh, myself. That was the very first place that I started learning Hebrew uh, some 30 years ago. So, yeah, let's continue. Because huh. it, so, this goes into a lot of philosophical debates I'd love to talk to you about, but if we could just stick on this subject. Th that's what I'm sticking on. This is very much germane to this topic. So, look, how do you say a virgin in Hebrew? What's the Hebrew word? Not sure. Please enlighten me. So, Tell me this. Let me just tell me this. If you're not sure, which is fine, which is fine, then how can you know that the word virgin appears in Isaiah 7 14? If, please don't be offended, if you wouldn't even know what word to look for. That is 100% the truth. I, I can only get through my Hebrew and my concordances, or, my, or I can only get through my English concordances. Like, I can't get through my Hebrew concordance because I don't know the language. So, as it turns out, in the Hebrew language, both in Biblical Hebrew and Modern Hebrew, there is only one way to convey certain virginity, and that is the word betula. Betula means that someone never had sexual intercourse with anyone. This is the word today, and the word in the Bible. It's a, a, a word that's found very frequently in the Hebrew scriptures because virginity was very, very important. And that's the key phrase. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, claims that Isaiah 7, 14 prophesizes that behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and Matthew continues, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And you go, well, okay, that's very, that's pretty serious. So what we do then is we... Listen, I, I know it's a little lengthy in what I'm doing here, but I think it's important, even though we started out at the beginning of the video where um, uh, Tovia is actually going into the details of what this video is about, I think it's important to listen to him and hear him out on his argument because I want you to be grounded and knowing how to def to defend this in the future. So pl please listen. You always go back to the original, right? You would always That's a key go, thing. Back and go back and check to the it original, out. That's what he's right? saying. Because there's a lot at stake. Like, if it said that in Isaiah 7, 14, that would be very significant. If it doesn't say that in Isaiah 7, 14, and the critical word there is virgin, if it doesn't say that, we can then conclude with certainty that whoever wrote the book of Matthew lied about Isaiah, mistranslated the verse, and therefore his credibility collapses along with the credibility of the entire Christian Bible. The Hebrew in Isaiah 7.14 says, now, I want to make sure you heard what he said, just like he said at the beginning. If he, if whoever wrote the book of Matthew, which would be Matthew, has either lied, or, or he's not just saying lied, he's flat out claiming that he lied about it, or he mistranslated it, 
because he's claiming that Matthew wrote the his book in the Greek or Greek language, so therefore he mistranslated it, and the entire credibility of Christianity comes into question as a result of that. So just keep that in mind. Really hold that close. Let's listen to what he says now. Behold, the Lord of his own will give you a sign. Behold, the young woman. Ha'alma means the young woman. Alma means a young woman. Elam means a young man. A young woman might be a virgin or might she might not be a virgin. English, obviously, is your native language. So is the term young woman and obviously, it's Tovia's native language as well because his Hebrew uh, pronunciation, and I'm not saying that mine's a whole heck of a lot better either, but it's not the best. So neither one of us, neither he or I, are native uh, Hebrew speakers. But uh, he is going to make a very valid point, and it's actually what I made uh, initially with uh, another person I debated on this issue years ago, that Alma... Uh, that is used in Hebrew there, it, yes, it does mean a young woman, but it is implied that she's a virgin. And of course, it could be implied either way. I agree with him on that. But that's not what we're going to get into. Let's listen on. Woman in English, does that mean a virgin? No. I can say, you see those young women there? They're not virgins. All married women. Or I can say those young women, they're all virgins, right? So there's nothing about the term a young woman that tells us anything about sexual history. It just tells us about their age, they're young, relatively young, and they're female, nothing else. If Isaiah sought to convey virginity, which is what Matthew has in mind in his infancy narrative, by misquoting Isaiah 7.14, Isaiah would have used the word betula. It would say instead, hine ha hara v'yeh The word hara means is pregnant. It's in the perfect tense. It doesn't mean shall be pregnant. What the author of Matthew did was mistranslate a critical passage, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. David, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, he's called an Elam, which is the male version of Alma. All right, we can stop there. That's going to give you the, the basis of what his argument is. and But he makes the claim that it collapses even Christianity. Well, we need to first establish something, though. All right, because Tovia claims that Matthew is basically translating it because it's written in Greek. So that's really the first principal argument uh, that's actually being made there. So I want to take you to, um, let's see here if I got the right place here. No, 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 no. Um, Actually, I'm going to have to look it up. I thought I had it already up on the page here, but I do not. Um, we did it the other day, so you already know about it. Uh, because Matthew wrote his gospel in the Hebrew language. And we're going to go back historically, and we're going to look at that just briefly so that we know this. All right. Um, here we go. Though no copies are extant, there is good historical evidence that Matthew's gospel was first written in Hebrew. Around 130 AD, church fathers Papias, a former student of the apostle John, explained. So then Matthew wrote the oracles in the Hebrew language, and everyone interpreted them as he was able. All right. So therefore, Matthew did write in Hebrew. He did not write it in English, or, or excuse me, in the Greek language. Polycarp, Irenaeus was a student of Polycarp, who was a student of the Apostle John in 170 AD. And Irenaeus confirms and elaborates upon Papias' report, saying that Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, 
while Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome and laying the foundations of the church. So we have there two church fathers going back as far as 130 and 170 AD, and granted still it was about 100 years after the birth of Christ, or the death of Christ, that attribute that Matthew had written the gospel in the Hebrew language. So we're going to go to this here now, and we're going to see Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew uh, is one of our best sources. Uh, if you've ever read or, or listened to Nehemiah Gordon, a former Orthodox Jew of the, from the Chabad organization, um, Nehemiah also clearly shows you that the idioms in Hebrew are more accurate in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew than that of the Greek Matthew, clearly identifying that Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew would be a more accurate uh, account of what Matthew wrote than what we even have in Greek. Now that's just from an argument from uh, from the biblical scholar uh, Tovia Singer, and he's a Karite Jew. He's not. He is not an Orthodox. He's no longer a uh, Chabad Jew, but nonetheless, he still holds to Judaism. He has never converted to Christianity. In fact, when I asked him one time, I said, "People are thinking you're secretly a Christian," and and uh, Nehemiah says says back to me, and we were communicating back and forth in some text one day. And he's like, Steve, who has told you that? I said, do you think I believe in Nehemiah? I said, no, I don't. I said, but nonetheless, I thought you might be curious to find that out. So he assured me, no, he is not. He's still a Karite Jew. And I respect that. No problem with that. But anyway, here we have right here, and I'm going to blow this up as a little bit bigger for you. Verse 23 right there, okay? So there you are on your screen, verse 23. This is the very uh, chapter 1, verse 23 of Matthew, what Matthew actually wrote. He says, Hineha al Mahara Vetaled ben Vekrashemo Emmanuel Shoel Amanu Elahim. All right, now the part that we have would be from right, hang on, let me see if I can get this done right here without messing up. Nope, it's not going to let me do it. Uh, when we get the last word you see highlighted on your screen, which is Vekrat, uh, Shemo, the next word is Shemo, his name, Emmanuel. He only quotes a small fragment of the Isaiah scroll. The next part, this part right here, Shoel Amano Elchim, is where Matthew is continuing on to say, he said, he said, what it says is, with us is our God. All right, so he's emphasizing what it actually says. But Matthew actually, for the sake of Tovia Singer, never said the word bitula in the actual text. He actually says alma or haama, the maiden, as Tovia brings out that Isaiah scroll says. So that is very true. Uh, what he is saying, if we look over here in Isaiah, here it is right here, hine haalma, okay, haalma. Chara veyeladat ben vekrat shemo imenu el. Okay, imenu el. Now, in the Masoretic text, we are actually reading, though, the words are separated. The imenu and the word el are separated as if it's two different names being that he's being called. He's being called with us as God. All right? But, We're going to get into this a little bit deeper on this issue here because of the fact that Tovia has now challenged what Matthew wrote, uh, even though what he wrote is not consistent to that of the Greek scriptures. Let me let me pull that up in the Greek, though, just so we have it as well, uh, because we want to be fair to Tovia and his arguments here. So we will pull this up, and we're going to be at verse 23, so I'll go ahead and highlight it. And as he says, behold, which he nay is behold, a virgin shall be with a child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as God with us. Okay. Now, this is what he is saying with is what he's actually saying there, that the word virgin is what comes in the challenge. But there again, this is a Greek manuscript. This had nothing to do with Matthew. And Tovia likes to say, you got to go back to the original. 
All right, you got to go back to the original. Now, Tovia is asserting that the Masoretic text, which is what the Tanakh is made from today, is the original. But the problem is, it's not the original. It's only what has been put together, edited over time, and in reality, never comes into publication until the 10th century after the birth of Christ. All right, keep that in mind. The 10th century. I want to show you the, uh, the evidence for that real quick here, just so you're aware of that, how that works. All right. Textual tradition of the Jewish scholars known as the Masoretes, or the Masoretes. The Masoretes were rabbis who made it their special work to correct the faults, notice that, that had crept into the text of the Old Testament during the Babylonian captivity, and to prevent for the future its being corrupted by any alteration. They first separated the apocryphal from the canonical books and divided the latter into 22 books, and being the number of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, then they divided each book into sections and verses. Now, what really give them the right to be able to say what was Babylon or you know the Babylonian things that were perverted or put in in the first place? Think about it, right? Uh, and I, I'm going to challenge you on this here, right? I'm I want and this is a challenge even to Tobia. Think about what you're saying, all right? And and I say that in light of another video that that you did that we quoted just the other day, and I'll play this clip for you about how serious Tobia takes even a letter. But it's from the Masoretic text, a text that didn't come along until, and, and in all fairness, I realize that rabbis have been working on this for a thousand years, allegedly, okay? Uh, so let's go on with it. And, and listen, I come from a Jewish family, Jewish background, so I'm not, I'm not here to beat up rabbis and I'm trying to pre preserve the Tanakh. I'm just simply saying, if you're going to take and be so critical on Matthew, and still you made a mistake in what you said because Matthew never used uh, bitula. He said alma, ha alma. And no, he wasn't the one that translated it into Greek either. So it was not his responsibility. Uh, and the, even, the, even in the Greek language that we have, that was translated, what, from the Latin language before it got into Greek? And what, is, what do we have? The oldest probably copy we have is from the 3rd or 4th century? So... We can't blame that on Matthew or even the original translators, maybe, that we don't even have copies of. Okay, so, and again, the Masoretic text never got published until the 10th century. So think about that. Listen now to what you're saying, though, Mr. Mr. Singer. That word emerges whatever it is. Every Hebrew word, there's a meaning of why the, every letter is important. And that's why if the rabbi is reading from a Torah scroll on Shabbos and one letter is not there, he has to stop reading from that Torah, put it back and get another Torah. Because if, if one word is missing or one word is added, you're destroying the world. You understand? Okay, and that's the argument that he makes. I mean, think about it. What an argument. But the problem is, there's a whole lot more missing in the Masoretic text, and it's not Babylonian. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain every book of the Bible or portions of those books of the Bible, with the exception of the book of Esther. Scholars conclude or believe that the reason the book of Esther was not concluded or was not included in the canonical uh, renditions of the uh, canonical uh, scrolls of the Bible was because the divine name was nowhere mentioned or at least alluded to within the writings that Esther did. Now, I don't think that's the reason for leaving it out, but at the time, they seemed to think that. Nonetheless, so, he says if one letter is missing, I want to show something to you, all right? If one letter is missing, now, if we look at the Hebrew Matthew, hine ha'alma, all right? Let's just take a look. Hey nun hey hine easy alma hey ayin lamed mem hey all right so we're gonna take real quick and we're gonna take and we're gonna look at the Masoretic text here hine alma spelled exactly the same way the first two words hara ve yaladat bain all right so let's go over it let's take a look at the Hebrew version of this 
ותלד בין. תלד ותלד בין. All right, the word bain is son. All right, but right here is conceived v'taled with a child. All right, but in the Masoretic we have not taled but v'yaladat. A completely different different spelling, and it actually does change. Bear a son. Uh, she shall bear a son. All right, and whereas Matthew wrote it a little bit different there. All right, now it's only the spelling is still with a son. Now let me just see how they translated that real quick. We'll just take a peek over here. Behold the young woman. See, they even translate it correctly. Behold the young woman is conceiving and will bear a son. It's conceiving and will bear a son. But we go now to the, um, let me see here where we get it at. Da, 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 da. Gonna call his main name Emmanuel. Now, even now the Masoretic does line up, and I know this is very difficult to see or understand here. It's even hard for me when you're trying to read from the uh, handwriting here. That's actually a noon, that's a bet, bane. So right here we have ve teledat, just like it is in the Masoretic. Now, why would then the only, so the really, it's not even the Alma, because they do have Alma in this as well, and it's very hard to see, but it is written there, Alma. Okay, ha alma is what's written there. The young woman, you can't see Hine in there. Hine is too is kind of missing on the broken part of the fragment of the page there. Uh, that she is going uh, she's going to have a child, and his name Ikra. Okay, and uh, and I think though, hang on one thing. That's one point I wanted to check on too. Let me go back and see real quick. Yeah, all right. Say. So, now, here's what we want to notice here, though. When, and I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. Let me slow down a little bit. When, we'll first come back to the Vyeladat. The Masoretic says Vyeladat. Okay? The, the young woman shall conceive and bear a son. Vyeladat vain. All right? The Masoretic, is perfectly in line with the spelling of what is written in the Dead Sea Scroll there. Let me find it again. Here it is right here. The Yaladat, the Tav is there. Now, when we look at the what Matthew wrote in here, though, he actually has it as Veteled. It still is giving birth to a son, a child. She's going to conceive a child, a son. But he doesn't, he spells it, he, he, the, you have the Yod and the Tav is at the end instead of the way that's written there. Still the same message, it's not a different translation. Uh, Tense-wise, you'd have a little different because of the tense. She shall birth a son. Is literally what you're looking at. This, this young woman is, she will birth a son. All right? That would be the only difference in that there. Now, Tovia might decide to throw Matthew still under the bus because he spelt it differently. As we just heard, if one letter is missing, you're taken away from the world, right? But when it comes to the Vekarat, what we have right here, and you and 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 you will call, and they will call his name. Emmanuel Karat Vekuf Resh Alef Tav, and then you go over to the Masoretic Vekuf Resh Alef Tav. Okay, that's exactly the way both Matthew wrote it and the way the Masoretic wrote it. But oddly enough, when you look at it over here. In the Dead Sea Scrolls book of Isaiah scroll, there's no Tav. It's just Ika. 
What's the difference? Okay. Over here, she's going to birth a son. This young woman is going to birth a son. Here it says he will be called, or his name will, uh, will be called, whereas the other way, you could do it as she would call his name. So the point is, is in the, we basically in the Masoretic, they added a letter, the letter Tav. And of course, Matthew also. Now, now keep in mind, this is not, even though we have this Matthew Shem Tov, this is in Hebrew, we still don't, it's not the original. We know it's not the original that was there, but it's believed to be a copy of a copy of however many copies down of the original. Did somebody else change what Matthew wrote and put the uh, put the Tav in there like the Masoretic text? Could be. Nobody really knows. But the point is, is if you're saying the Masoretic text can't even have a letter missing or added to without distorting the Word of God, well, they both did that. All right? That's the, that's the point I'm trying to make here. But really what Tovia is pointing out, though, is the word Alma. It is a young maiden, not a bitula, not a virgin, but a young maiden. And so therefore he's arguing that Matthew has just distorted. He lied is what he says. He lied. He mistranslated or whatever. Well, the argument comes back, though. No, he did not lie because Matthew did write in the Hebrew language and he did call it Ha Alma, the young maiden. He did not lie, Tovia. No, the scripture is not unraveled. And to the argument that you make that the that the original, the Masoretic is some somehow the original language of the Bible, and I do lean a lot on the Masoretic text myself, but I do a lot of cross-referencing as well. I do go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls because the Dead Sea Scrolls are far more accurate than what we have in the Masoretic text. And no, it's not just little letter here and there missing. In some cases, we have multiple words in Isaiah missing out of lines. It's very, it's very rare, but they are there. I have read them myself. I've actually gone and I've taken the entire, uh, excuse me, the entire uh, Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah here, and I've gone through it line by line just to see for myself, how many times, you know, and I don't remember now what the, what the numbers were, but I would find, especially in the first five chapters, I would find several words missing in some cases in a verse. And I forget if exactly if it was up to the fifth chapter or maybe up to the tenth chapter, I forget when I first began to do this. Most of the times it's punctuation and spelling. But the strange thing is, this is not the only Isaiah scroll that was discovered. And oddly enough, can't seem to get a hold of that other one that was discovered. Scholars are allowed to look at it. But according to Rachel Lior, it has meaningful differences than what we have. This they publish because it's close to the Masoretic text. 5% inaccuracy. Wow, 5% inaccuracy. How many words are in the book of Isaiah? Then you got a 5% inaccuracy of the Masoretic text. That's a lot of mistakes. But I'm not here to, 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 to split hairs to begin with. Whereas Tovia is trying to take the word Alma and make it look like Matthew was a liar, which he was never a liar to begin with. He quoted it accurately. Uh, but why is it that we get these things happening? And if you want to really argue it, look at the book of Genesis in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Masoretic text starts with Barashid Bara Elohim et HaShemayim et HaAretz, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Genesis doesn't start like that at all. In fact, you've got about, I forget how many chapters, multiple chapters there, that go into a lot more depth than what we even have in our book of Genesis. So they call it the Apocryphon Genesis. What, why do they call it the Apocryphon Genesis? Just because the, uh, the Kohanim family, the, the Kohanim uh, bloodline, actually kept it correct to start with? And now you want to call that the Apocryphon? I mean, come on. You know, Tovia, you got to stop misleading the people like that. And, and, and granted, I say misleading because you do know that the Dead Sea Scrolls have got a lot of differences compared to the Masoretic text. So don't use that as your argument. 
you know. Now, as far as whether or not Matthew wrote in the Hebrew language and Alma and Bitula, whether or not he did or did not, I'll give you credit. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you did not know that, you know, that Matthew wrote in the Hebrew language. I find that hard to believe as well as, you, as well trained you are and versed you are. But nonetheless, okay, I'll give you benefit of the doubt. Now, but let's also make again, because it seems to be that, um, that this whole issue with the Isaiah scroll becomes the key focal point on Matthew. I want to play for you Rachel Elor. Uh, she is the uh, biblical scholar who has worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, she was lecturing here at the University of Chicago. She is a Jewish woman. She is not a Christian woman, to my knowledge. Uh, and I want you to hear her own words, what she said about the Isaiah scroll. Let's listen in. More than that, after we say that about one-fifth of the collection is biblical books, which offer very interesting textual renditions, very interesting textual traditions, which were not known to us before the scrolls were found. Like, for instance, we have the scroll of Isaiah, close enough to the biblical tradition. But we have another scroll of Isaiah, which have meaningful differences. Now, what is the meaning of those meaningful differences? It means that different communities had different recensions of the Bible. There was not only one canonical scroll of Isaiah, there were more than one recension. This is very interesting to us. We didn't know it. We know, of course, about the Septuaginta. We know about the Samaritan version. But we didn't know that there were other versions in Hebrew which are not exactly as the biblical tradition. Now, put the biblical part aside. Because not exactly like the biblical tradition. The Masoretic text is a biblical tradition. By the way, this here is... Uh, I mean, this is, this is Rachel Elor right here, uh, just so you know who she is. Um, and again, you know, an amazing... Uh, uh, scholar, and uh, and I would love to know more about that Isaiah scroll, scroll that has meaningful differences. Uh, as we know as well, the Septuagint, the the uh, the other one that she mentions as well, uh, the Samaritan version of Isaiah. Uh, we also have the scroll that the Israelis never allowed to go public, uh, not scroll, but the Bible from Syria that was smuggled into Israel. And then Israel ends up keeping it under lock and key and not letting the world see. Why? And the Jewish people are no different than Christians. And I say Christians, whether it be the Catholic Church or whoever decided to hide different books and things like that. Uh, but nonetheless, coming back to the chief part of this argument of Tovia Singer, that Matthew lied or that Matthew mistranslated uh, the Hebrew words, and thus Christianity is to be thrown out the window. Totally false. Totally false. And the argument could be made in that case, as well as with the Tanakh. Because there are many mistakes in the Masoretic text compared to that of the Dead Sea Scrolls Biblical Hebrew. And as Rachel brings out in her also in her argument that different communities had different renditions of the book of Isaiah and they're all Jewish interesting I hope it helps and please support the work we do your help is really vital in being able to spend time in the research and study of the things that we do here thank you God bless you israelinewslive.org or you can donate under my name is Stephen Benoon at P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. God bless.